able to see properly. It's overrated. <laughs> it is overrated, although it does change my concentration. Okay. <laughs> Hello. I think we're live on Facebook. We are. And what a stunning evening it is here in Queensland at the moment. I know. I can Thank see you. out my window just here and it's the perfect day. Well, thank you for being patient with my being late, everybody. I feel somewhat guilty about saying that we can go to the beach, uh, knowing that in other parts of the world, infection rates are still high. Uh, but fortunately, we are so lucky to be able to still spend plenty of time outdoors. So thank you for your patience is the gist there. And uh, we have an exciting topic for you tonight. Um, we do. Yeah, we're looking at uh, empathy. Um, I'm particularly interested in the conversation that you and I had yesterday, Dr. Rachel, around um, what defines empathy in contrast to some of the other uh, similar feelings, particularly sympathy and, and compassion, which uh, I know that you uh, are equally passionate about. And um, what have we in uh, the comments today, Rachel? Was there any suggestions that you discovered? Well, I um, only posted 20 minutes ago that we were running five minutes late. I did ask for um, questions about um, empathy, the what and the why and the how and the when of empathy. And the questions I asked are, are there ever times when empathy is maybe not appropriate? Um, and another question I know we've had in the past is how can you learn empathy as a skill set? Um, and the other sort of questions I've had in the past on social media, are, what if the other person's not being empathic? You know, how can I stay empathic if the other person's not operating from empathy? Okay. Um, and so I know these are questions that sometimes come up. So I, was, I put them in the post from 20 minutes ago just to see if um, these are questions some of our listeners have. Let me just scroll down and see if anyone had questions from my post this morning no a few likes but no comments but um in that case I'd really like to sort of maybe start with your you know we because some of the people listening know that um that we walk twice a week we go for our wonderful walks along the Brisbane River and we were talking about the differences between compassion empathy and sympathy and I know you've been reflecting on that a bit today Alexis what are your thoughts Rachel thank you for honoring that time it's such a precious precious time in my week um, me too me too and yeah we you know we really do get a chance to reflect in those times and when I um, came to the definition of empathy in fact there's a, an example uh, that happened on the drive down with my daughter to the beach today, which I'd love to share, which demonstrates the definition of empathy really quite beautifully. Um, she was sharing with me some difficulties she's having with a teacher at school. And as you have taught me to connect with my feelings and needs, uh, I'm, I'm sharing that with her and, you know, I think I've lost you, Alexis. For some reason, your face is far. There you are, you're back. You're back so, as well. Sorry, I lost you for a minute. Oh, that's okay. Um, so long as we're all smooth on Facebook. So what happened uh, during this process of her reflection on her feelings within her body uh, is that I... I had to really just talk about my observations and almost embody what she was embodying. Yeah. And uh, the definition I've since learned for empathy, now pathos we know is suffering, but the, the prefix EM is um, to put into. And I found that quite fascinating, to put into suffering. And I was thinking that sounds kind of in contrast to what my understanding of empathy is and that you're wanting to relieve the suffering. But I noticed in the conversation with my daughter that indeed I needed to put her into it. I had to embody it, reflect it back to her. As uncomfortable as that was, 
for both of us to be in this kind of blocked state, she was able to identify it. And then we did manage to do a similar thing for the needs. We pulled up a, a list, as, as I know that you use in your clinical practice frequently, yes. as such a simple, yes. simple document. And she was able to identify choice. Uh, so mm. the definition of empathy to put into suffering just uh, registered on reflection of that experience. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for that story. I um, and you know, hearing that her need was for choice, which you know, sometimes looking at those needs lists and the feelings lists can be so helpful to make conscious and clear, you know, what it is that I'm wanting that I'm not getting or I think I'm not getting. And choice is such a strong one for teenagers, isn't it? Mm. Autonomy, freedom of choice. Um. The, the working definition I use of empathy in my clinical yes. practice is um, simple. It's very simple. It's just showing an interest in the other person's feelings and needs. That's all. So everybody can work with that definition. Yes. And self-empathy is showing an interest in my own feelings and needs. Very simple definition. As long as I'm interested in something, I turn my attention to it. So when I decide to be interested in what I feel and what I need, and I stop being so interested in my opinions, mm. which is very mm. easy for us as humans to be very stuck in our opinions. Mm. But I want to turn my interest to the feelings and the needs. Um, now, this um, topic is called the how, when, and why of empathy. Yeah. Because I've noticed sometimes articles, even in big publications like the New York Times, say, you know, empathy is not always good sometimes we can be too empathic you know there's this sort of argument that's made about empathy not always being appropriate um, and so I wanted to address you know when empathy what empathy is not you know you and I have talked about um, some of the other things that are not exactly empathy and they talk about this in nonviolent communication and we see things like sympathy cheerleading colluding telling your own story um and there's other responses human beings regularly give that are not exactly empathy and which is not to say that they're wrong okay because sometimes when somebody colludes with me and tells me you know yeah I'm on your side you know that's not always such a bad thing for that moment hmm. or a bit of sympathy so I, I don't want people to kind of go away from our workshops that we run and think I must always be doing empathy at every moment of every day you know um and there's times when empathy is really helpful really appropriate and you know and you don't have to be doing it 24 7 either um is is kind of a key message you've touched on a well it's a help it's helpful i think for us all to get very clear about the language that we're using when we're talking about feelings and a simple discussion around definitions with a close friend can be an invaluable experience. So um, I think it, it makes good sense for us today to look at what empathy is not and in doing so help to identify what it really is. Mm. And I love that you mentioned earlier this relationship between the way that we provide empathy to others is no doubt the way that we are providing empathy to ourselves. And that offers a segue into uh, the definition of sympathy, which... Uh, when I looked up the prefix sim in contrast to em, so s y m means mm. means together, together suffering. So almost like you're in it together, a bit like colluding, like oh you poor thing, and you know yeah. I'm going in there with you. And I just kind of we both just kind of lower <laughs> our expectations, our vibration. We both kind of drop into this experience, which is, is kind of like the blind leading the blind or someone drowning, just bringing someone else down. And my sense on reflection of, of the prefix sim is that that is indeed, if I provided sympathy to myself, I would be saying, poor, poor you. I mean, in fact, this happened on the drive here, I was reflecting on, okay, well, if I have self-sympathy for this moment, knowing that I'm going to be late for our live at five, then I would have been telling myself, oh, poor you, Lexi, you know, you've got this terrible habit, you're never going to break it, uh, and, and kind of colluding with myself, dropping my 
standards, dropping my uh, energy to a lower standard, being in this together. And I think that can happen in a therapeutic situation. In fact, I, I'm sure, you know, that, that the shift to empathy has lifted my clinical practice uh, because sympathy doesn't really help either of us. Mm. Yeah, most of the time that's true. Although there have been moments in my life where I've said, I just would like a bit of sympathy right now, just for a moment. Is it? <laughs> Is like, it? Yeah. You poor thing. And I was like, yeah, you know, because it's okay to sort of, we're human and sometimes we need a discharge of discomfort and distress. And so I understand that these other ways mm. of attempting to connect with one another have also developed over the course mm. of human history and language. And mm. you know, sometimes there are moments of collusion and sympathy mm. which help you feel less alone. Mm. In, in my view, it, we just don't want to stop there. We don't want to set up camp. You know, we don't want to set up camp in collusion and in feeling sorry for ourselves. It's just a, something to transition through. To me, empathy is a more mature response at the end of the day. Um, and it's nice. And so maybe we should talk about like, I've given the definition of being interested in feelings and needs. So I wonder if actually, Alexis, you would probably be a great person being newer to NBC than I am, nonviolent communication or empathic communication to outline for people kind of what the four steps of the process are and more importantly, in your experience, I'd love to know why it's sat so with so much resonance for you, why you perceive it as so helpful. I love your questions, Rachel. I'm wondering if I might be able to demonstrate it because I notice that my cat is calling outside <laughs> okay, and I yeah. feel that as we're talking about empathy, some compulsion, I feel... I feel, I feel some empathy because I need connection and yeah. to know that I'm taking care of my responsibilities. So would you excuse me for a moment while I, <laughs> my request to, uh, to just open the door. Your request is that we wait patiently while you open up the door for your cat. We'd, I'm sure we'd all love to meet your cat. Yes, thanks. Well, how about while you do that, I'll run through the four steps of, of NBC. This is a life-changing body of work for me as a psychologist, not taught at university. I make observations about what I've seen and heard. I say how I feel about those observations. I connect my feelings to my unmet needs. And on that basis, I ask for what I want. I make a request. Very simple, not easy. And who is this, Alexis? Oh, this is Amara. Amara is named after my son, my 12-year-old son. Amara means everlasting love. Oh. <laughs> He's a total sob. And she is such a sweetheart. She looks sweet. So, yes, I'm so pleased you've introduced the four steps, Rachel, because this is seminal to our work. It's our kind of primary practice. And um, it has been, to answer your question, how, why is it sat with me? I, I think really because I have known for a long time that emotions are very strong in me and that they can overtake my experience mm. um, and that I've needed an avenue to facilitate a more logical approach to my feelings and that's what it has provided undoubtedly. Mm. That's so interesting to hear you say that. I was rereading Marshall Rosenberg's book today, the chapter on identifying feelings. I think it's called Detecting Feelings. Okay. So for people listening, not, not a familiar, Marshall Rosenberg wrote a book in the 80s called Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Um, and I still am so grateful for my introduction to this body of work. And in the feelings chapter, he tells a story of a law student client he was seeing who said, my flatmate plays his stereo late at night. And Marshall Rosenberg said, what's the feeling you have about this observation, you know, playing the stereo loudly? And he said, well, I think it's inconsiderate and rude. And Rosenberg said, well, what's the feeling that it leaves you with? And he said, well, I think that it's unfair. And, it, and, and Rosenberg kept saying, you're giving opinions. You're giving opinions. That's another opinion. What are the feelings in you about this? And the student said, I don't have any feelings. 
in a very emotional tone. I said, I don't have any <laughs> I'm not angry. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I am not getting angry. And um, he, he didn't. Uh, and then Rosenberg actually goes on to say that there are certain professional groups for whom emotions are bred out of them. Identifying emotions are actually is actually um, not encouraged and even discouraged. And he named law, um, policing, the military and engineering as four um, areas of professional life where emotions are actively discouraged as not objective um, data. So some professional groups more than others and some families more than others um, are not encouraged, let alone taught, to identify emotions and understand what their emotions are telling them. But if we're talking about empathy, what it is, why you would do it, how you would do it, which is what we're talking about today, we need to build an awareness and a vocabulary around our feelings, around our emotions, so that we can name them and so that we can then ask, well, why am I feeling this? And in in the work that you and I do and that, you know, um, in many modalities which are emotion-focused, we see emotions as data. So actually they're very reasonable experiences. There are reasons. Reasonable means there are reasons for why we feel whatever we feel, whether it's shame or anxiety, disappointment, hurt, confusion or something else. So often we either don't know what we're feeling or we feel ashamed for what we're feeling. And what we want people to know is empathy takes out the shame and the judgment and the blame. You know, empathy is almost the opposite of those things. And it, um, it encourages us to be curious and interested in what is it that I'm feeling? How does it feel in my body? And what name would I give for it? So language makes it conscious. And then why, you know, is there something I'm needing that I'm not getting? It's such a simple question. I often ask my clients, is there something you're needing that you're not getting? And of course, sometimes that's a surprising question and people don't know, but it's certainly food for thought. And they might say, you know, I need my boss to blah, 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 which is a strategy, not quite a need. So I say, and what would that give you? And then they might say, well, that would give me a sense of being included or a sense of mattering, like I'm valued. Aha, there's the need. That is the psychological need that you are, you know, experiencing as being unfulfilled or unsupported. Mm. And, and that's me giving empathy to them in the moment, helping them identify their unsatisfied need. So it's funny because empathy is perceived as this fuzzy wuzzy kind of thing. Mm. And in, but it's not, it's really a very logical scientific thing, right? Yeah, it's interesting. It, the, the, the definition to put someone into their suffering continues to make more and more sense um, based on what you've said about yeah, getting to the underlying curiosity beyond the shaming and the blaming. Mm. being curious we're putting someone into their suffering encouraging that sense of safety and and guidance if necessary to go into it to be curious about the body put some language to it even language is embodied we're making sound we're making shape we're mm. giving form to something that otherwise is is um pure sensation yeah pure sensation hard harder to grasp yes exactly and so empathy going into our suffering, we can't understand our suffering if we or our pain if we don't face it, right, or go into it. So much, so much of the work of self-growth, self-work and, and therapy is, and the work you do as well, I know, Alexis, is supporting ourselves and each other to sit with and go into what's going on for us. Um, so empathy to be in and with your suffering. Mm. beautiful and just before we move on you mentioned the definition well you mentioned that uh, yeah the difference between a need and a strategy and quite often uh, a simple way to recognize those is that I need you is the phrase I need my boss to that is a clear indication that in, in fact I'm trying to kind of move away from my suffering if I'm going into the story about it if I'm going into even if I'm going into shame about it I'm not actually moving into it 
even if I'm going into a strategy, I must solve it by this means, or I need you to, I'm actually moving away rather than putting myself into the pathos, the suffering. Mm. So I think you've given some really valuable skills. Uh, is that what you had in mind in terms of empathy and, and the skill set, those it, four steps? I really wanted to share those four steps. Thank you, Alexis. And I wanted to say one more thing because it's the it's the when, you know, we put in the yes. title, the when of empathy. Yes, the appropriate. And, sometimes, yes. and then we'll talk about our, our um, workshops quickly and then I really must go because I'm off to um, a social event with my husband. Oh, um, yes. Which is, um, yeah, which Very is nice. kind of... Um, exciting and something I'm looking forward to so sometimes people ask me when would it not be appropriate to be in the mindset of or the state of empathy and I think there aren't too many situations where empathy is not warranted but um, in the nonviolent communication book I referenced earlier if your physical safety or somebody's physical safety is under threat or there's an imminent injustice then uh, Rosenberg um, endorses what we call the protective use of force. I'm not going to try and do empathy with someone who's trying to steal my handbag. I'm just not, (laughs) you know, or I might just give him my handbag because I'm scared, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, if, if, if someone's trying to hurt me or my child or my property, I'm probably going to do whatever I can Mm -hmm. to stop that person with minimal harm, protect myself Mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's very obvious situations where physical safety needs to be protected um, or somebody else needs to be protected from imminent harm. And absolutely, it would be inappropriate and, and sort of strange to be guessing the person's feelings and needs when physical safety is the priority. Mm-hmm. Um, but in his opinion, in that chapter, which I just reread, there um there are very few situations otherwise where bringing a curiosity and an interest to your own and the other person's emotions and needs is not helpful. It, it's hard, but it's very helpful. And the hard part is just the practice, which is what our workshops are about, which we'll, I'll get you to talk about in a second, but the practice of staying with that curiosity, that openness mm-hmm. to feelings and needs and bypassing judgment and blame. Not always easy to do, but so, so helpful. Yes, I love that piece of the puzzle, Rachel, the bypassing of shame and blame using empathy. Thank you. And before I let you know about the workshops briefly, um, there is a story, a very brief story uh, about you, Rachel, that I would love to share with your permission. And yes. I won't keep you, but you demonstrated the value of nonviolent communication in a situation where you, those around you, myself included, were concerned for your safety. And you managed to maintain your empathy with the other person, irrespective of their level of empathy. So that answers one of the one of the audience questions Mm. and irrespective of whether it was appropriate because the messaging all around you was that it was more appropriate for you to drop the empathy and to protect yourself. And yet I saw you, Rachel, stay with that. I saw you stay with that. You know the experience I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you did. You stayed and stayed. You stayed empathic even though it wasn't, it may not have been appropriate, even though the others may not have been. Anyway, it, for me, it was, a, it was a, a very, very valuable observation to see that nonviolent communication works if you stay with it. Yes. And so, I'd like to, so people don't compare themselves with my amazing prowess. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you heard it. Uh, um, I have been studying nonviolent communication and similar modalities for about 15 years. So, you know, it has taken me quite a while to fully integrate it into my thinking and behavior. And my husband would say that I still don't always apply it, which is absolutely true. Um, But when it comes to big things in my life and moments that really matter, I really try to apply it. And, and I guess I just wanted to say that it takes practice, practice, practice. And we have opportunities to practice with us. Yes. 
and uh, we hope you'll make the most of those. So um, tell us, tell us. So we have three workshops coming up. Uh, one is actually next Sunday. That's our kickoff. Now, if you'd like to join us for the full series, jump on board because this is where we focus on ourselves and regulating ourselves. Our second one is in October and, uh, sorry, November. So we have October 17th. We have November 14th. They're all Sunday mornings. So it should be a good time to just step away from family and then bring back all of the, the value that you've, learned, that you've gained, that you've learned. And uh, our second workshop is about, is much more interpersonal focus. We will be applying the four-step techniques that Rachel has mentioned today. And, uh, and we, we're focused on attachment theory, which is certainly in the ether in my world. Uh, so I think there'll be many of you who are interested in, in that second one. Yes. And our third one, which is particularly exciting for us, uh, because it's kind of the culmination of our at least 12 months uh, working together is the transcendence of nonviolent communication and how we can apply these principles to go beyond our own mundane existence and gain perspective and clarity and experience a, a much broader sense of connection uh, with that sense of overriding order. And that is, um, from my experience, really how we go beyond our own emotions. Uh, we ultimately learn to rise above it. So that's going to be a fascinating uh, workshop on the 12th of December. Yes. And will you, after we get off this video, Alexis, will you um, post a link to the bookings page for those workshops in the yes. comments, please? Booking page, I will. Wonderful. Okay, well, I would always love to stay and keep chatting with you, Alexis, and looking at um, the comments and answering questions. I've answered a couple of questions in um, writing, um, but I must go. So thank you to Sarah and Jessica and Sandy and Joe and Althea and Mark and Wendy and Tracy and Rachel and Colleen and Olivia and Linda and Asha and a whole bunch of other people, Raylene, yeah. for joining us and Magel um, for tuning in. Kelly, thank you. Kylie and Zelda and Diane, Kate, mm -hmm. Sharon. Thank you so much for Hi. watching. Yes, beautiful to have you with us. You are the ones that inspire us to do what we do. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you next Sunday. Gosh, I've just seen how much sun I've got today. I better go and hydrate. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> aloe vera gel. And um, once Thanks, again, aloe. Alexis will put the link to our workshops in the comments. Mm. So check that out. And hopefully we'll see a couple of you next Sunday morning. And we'll definitely see you next Sunday evening on Facebook. Five at five. Have a saucy night. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Bye. See everyone. Bye.